So this is basically my World Cup review videos all in one, plus a bunch of content that was before I even started this series in November. And trust me, it isn't just a little bit of additions here or there. I, I went the extra mile. There's like 10 pages of new shit. Oh yeah, also, I got a new Discord. Uh, link will be in the description. <laughs> UEFA World Cup qualification is one of the less complex pathways, up until you get to the playoff round. Every recognized member of UEFA was categorized into different pots based on their FIFA ranking. From there, they'd be drawn into groups of five or six, and at the end of this round, each group winner qualifies for Qatar automatically, while each runners-up advances to the playoff round. In this round alone, you will see 10 teams confirm themselves a ticket to Qatar. But how about we go over some of the groups? Group A, we have Portugal, Serbia, Republic of Ireland, Luxembourg, and Azerbaijan. Portugal's best run in the World Cup was back in 1966 when they finished third. Serbia finished fourth twice back in 1930 and 1962 when they were part of Yugoslavia. However, as an independent nation, they have never made it out of the groups. Ireland is currently in a drought period, having not qualified since 2002 when they reached the last 16. Luxembourg has never qualified, but is looking better and better every year. And like Luxembourg, Azerbaijan also have never qualified for the World Cup. In Group B, we have Spain, Sweden, Greece, Georgia, and Kosovo. Spain won the World Cup back in 2010. Sweden reached the quarterfinals of 2018 after missing out in the last two editions. Greece has three World Cup appearances, 1994, 2010, and 2014. They missed out in 2018, and this probably didn't help them. Georgia has never qualified, but is also seeing quite the youth movement. Kosovo have only been members of FIFA since 2015 and nearly qualified for Euro 2020, so you can never count them out either. Group C sees Italy, Switzerland, Northern Ireland, Bulgaria, and Lithuania. Four-time champs Italy have not seen the knockout stages of the World Cup since 2006 when they won the whole thing. The Swiss, as of late, have made qualifying a tradition, having made the last four editions. They will hope to at least break the drought of not having made the quarterfinals since like the 50s, though. Northern Ireland has not qualified for the tournament since 1986, and their coach currently leading them was just four years old at the time. Bulgaria had an impressive run going throughout the late 20th century, with the fourth place finish in 1994 being their highest point. However, in the new millennium, they've been, um... Pretty terrible. And then there's Lithuania, who have never qualified as an independent nation. Group D has France, Ukraine, Finland, Bosnia and Herzegovina, and Kazakhstan. Reigning champions France added their second star in 2018 and hope to retain their status with such an insane core of talent. Ukraine is seemingly on the up and will hope to qualify for the first time since 2006 when they reach the quarterfinals. Finland is another team that have been improving and hope to make history again and qualify for the World Cup for the first time ever. As an independent nation, Bosnia has only qualified once for the World Cup and that was back in 2014. And shout out Kazakhstan. I've never been, but my friends have, and they also got me this scarf. In terms of World Cup qualification though, they've never made it, and also in their last campaign, they failed to even win once. Group E, Belgium, Wales, Czech Republic, Belarus, and Estonia. Belgium's golden generation is running out of time. Their best finish, however, came in the last tournament when the Belgians came in third. Wales, after agonizing defeat after agonizing defeat, hoped to qualify for the first time since 1958 when they reached the quarters. The Czechs, as an independent nation have only qualified once in over 20 years, and that was back in 2006. Both Belarus and Estonia have never qualified. Group F, we have Denmark, Austria, Scotland, Israel, Faroe Islands, and Moldova. A very interesting one. Denmark's best finish in the World Cup goes all the way back to 1998 when they reached the quarterfinals. Speaking of 98, the Austrians and Scottish haven't seen the big dance since then. Israel's drought is even larger. They haven't been the World Cup since 1970. Faroe Islands and Moldova both have never qualified. Although, I guess the Faroe Islands can at least flex the fact that they're two-time winners of the island games. Group G has the Netherlands, Turkey, Norway, Montenegro, Latvia, and Gibraltar. Funnily enough, every single team that you see in this group did not qualify for 2018. The biggest shock, though, were the Netherlands, because before then, they finished second in 2010 and third in 2014. Turkey's last appearance at a World Cup was 2002, where the team proved all doubters wrong and finished third. Norway hoped that their investments into a cyber initiative bring them back to the world's tournament for the first time since 98. <sighs> no, you ripped up my heart. 
Montenegro didn't become an independent nation until 2006, so it's pretty understandable that they've never qualified, but they have come decently close in 2010 and 2014. Latvia has never been to the World Cup, and same with Gibraltar, but they're literally four years old. Group H, Croatia, Russia, Slovakia, Slovenia, Cyprus, and Malta. Croatia loves a Cinderella run. They've done it twice. 1998, they finished third, and 20 years later, they finished runners-up. Russia proved a lot of people wrong back in 2018 with an eighth place finish as host. Slovakia has not been in the World Cup since 2010, where they had their incredible triumph against the Italians. Slovenia has also not been in the tournament since 2010, but Cyprus and Malta have not even come close. Hell, Malta only has two wins in qualifying since 1974. Group I has England, Poland, Hungary, Albania, Andorra, and San Marino. England, having failed to bring it home again, hoped to finally do it in 2022 with a star-studded squad. Poland's best finish in the World Cup is third. They did it twice in 1974 and 1982. The Mighty Magyars of Hungary will forever be a what-if story. The 1954 team scored 27 goals but failed to beat West Germany in the final. Since then, there was a massive decline due to the revolution, but now things look on the up. Hungary are hoping to qualify for the first time since 1986. The Albanians are too on the up and will hope to qualify for the first time ever, while Andorra and the worst team in Europe, San Marino, make qualification look pretty much impossible. Finally, we have Group J with Germany, Romania, Iceland, North Macedonia, Armenia, and Liechtenstein. Germany are four-time World Cup winners, with their most recent being in 2014. Romania used to be one of the most entertaining teams to watch in the 90s. Their golden generation finished sixth back in 1994. However, since then, they've declined significantly and haven't qualified since France 98. Iceland throughout the mid-2010s was the underdog story. Quarterfinals in Euro 2016 and following that up coming decently close to the last 16 of World Cup 2018. North Macedonia has never qualified for the World Cup, but hope this is the campaign after a successful birth into Euro 2020. And finally, Armenia and smaller Liechtenstein have never qualified for the tournament ever. Welcome to the halfway mark. Two international windows down, let's go look at the standings. With two international windows remaining, Portugal currently lead Group A with 13 points. In the September window, Portugal managed two wins, and Ronaldo became the all-time leading international scorer. But not far off are Serbia, who just dropped points on the last match day of September after a late own goal. Still somewhat hanging in there is third place Luxembourg, who have two wins, two losses, and actually gave Portugal an early scare. Although Spain lead Group B, they haven't exactly looked that great. They had a scare against Georgia, Georgia drew against Greece and also lost to Sweden. Speaking of Sweden, they can easily overtake Spain in the next window as they have two games in hand, although a loss against Greece could create a few questions going forward. The Greeks also have two games in hand and are actually unbeaten, albeit three draws and one win. In Group C, Italy lead with 14 points and have only conceded just a single goal, although that goal does come from a one-all draw against Bulgaria and Florence. Switzerland are currently second with eight points and two games in hand. Thanks to their nil-nil draw against the Italians at home, two wins pretty much puts them up on par. France is currently cleaning shop in Group D with absolutely no one near them, but below the French is a very interesting battle for the playoff spot. Second place Ukraine is, for some reason, allergic to wins. They have five draws in five matches. The only other team that knows how to win besides France in this group is Finland, who have two games in hand. That means if Finland can manage results against Ukraine and Kazakhstan, it puts them closer to making history again. And not too far off from those two two are Bosnia and Kazakhstan, holding on by a thread with their three points. Belgium at this point look all but certain to qualify for yet another World Cup. The battle for the playoff spot, however, is a lot tighter. Both the Czech Republic and Wales are tied. The Czechs have the advantage on goal difference, but the Welsh have a game in hand. Camry will hope to take advantage of that, though, because a draw against Estonia on the final match day of September put a massive dent in their campaign. Denmark is running away in Group F with a perfect six wins out of six. The playoff spot, much like the other groups, has a lot more competition though. Israel is practically breathing down Scotland's neck, and not too far off is Austria, who are just four points away. The fight for the top spot in Group G is getting intense. The Netherlands, thanks to their plus 16 goal difference, hold first at the moment, and that's pretty impressive considering how disastrous their campaign started. Norway, though, is tied with them, and Turkey is just two points behind in third. Turkey will definitely want to forget about this window though. With four games to go, Croatia and Russia are tied, with Croatia just edging past through goal difference. Slovakia is four points behind them, and a recent win versus the Russians will keep their spirits up. Same with Slovenia, who managed to defeat Croatia on match day one, but they do have a much more difficult gap to close. England leads Group I and look to qualify pretty easily, although there's a pretty big surprise in second currently. 
Albania. Armando Broja has been killing it, and his goal against Hungary was nothing but brilliant. Although Poland haven't had a great start, they've already played England twice and grabbed a point from them in the process. So going forward, their schedule is a little bit less stressful. And then there's Hungary, right there in the mix, just two points from the playoff spot. So with four games to go, it's any of those three countries' spot to grab. Germany started September with a very iffy result against Liechtenstein, but two four-plus goal results later, and the Germans have shot up four points above second place. Armenia is surprising everyone in second, but the cracks may be showing after a draw at home to Liechtenstein. Damn, I mean, at this point, maybe we're the ones doubting the mighty Liechtenstein. Right behind them, though, is Romania and North Macedonia, who with one slip could overtake the Armenians in a heartbeat. Oh, and remember that amazing football fairy tale? Yeah, it's been absolutely tarnished by a sex abuse scandal and the dumb f**ks who downplayed it. We'll start off with the European qualifiers since the first round is now complete. Group A had a battle between Serbia and Portugal. Portugal had two more matches to play, Ireland away and then Serbia at home. Serbia on the other hand just had one match remaining and that would be Portugal away obviously. Portugal failed to beat Ireland but it still meant being a top of the group due to goal differential. Serbia still very much had a chance to qualify for the World Cup but of course a match away in Portugal is going to be quite difficult. So now comes Serbia versus Portugal to end Group A. All Portugal had to do was at least draw and they qualify for the World Cup, while Serbia had to win. Portugal acquired the lead early on, but a Tadic equalizer cancelled things whoa, whoa. out. But with a one-all scoreline as it stood, Portugal would qualify. But then in the 90th minute, Aleksandr Mitrovic came in with the heroics. His game-winning header sends Serbia to the World Cup automatically, while Portugal are sent off to the playoff round with a real threat of not qualifying. Group B had another heavyweight battle between Sweden and Spain. Both nations would face each other in their last qualifiers to determine who qualifies for the World Cup, and Sweden could have had the upper hand going into the final match, but they lost against Georgia. Spain took advantage of this by beating Greece 1-0 and then beating Sweden in their last qualifier to automatically qualify for the World Cup while Sweden go into the playoff round along with Portugal. Group C saw the Swiss and the Italians have a bout that could only end in a draw. Jorginho had the chance to give Italy an advantage late on, but uh... Yeah. So now it was down to the final match day for the two. Switzerland were playing at home against Bulgaria, while Italy had to play Northern Ireland away. The Swiss took care of business, while the Italians could only get a draw against Northern Ireland, meaning Switzerland automatically qualify for the World Cup, while Italy again go into a playoff round. Man, you Italians sure better hope that 2017 doesn't repeat itself. Group D was pretty much decided who was going to be going to the World Cup, France obviously, and Mbappe's four goals against Kazakhstan basically sealed the deal. Now the playoff spot, as I said before, the last qualifier video was definitely up for grabs though. Finland had a massive victory against Bosnia 3-1, but then they had France. And Ukraine only had one match, and as long as they could win that match, they would go into the playoff round which they did. All credit to the Finns though, they performed really well against a strong French side and unfortunately it just wasn't their day. Group B, not too much here. Belgium sealed the deal and find a ticket to Qatar, while the Welsh finish second go on to the playoffs and also the Czech Republic go on to the playoffs. Why is that? Because they're one of the top two Nations League group winners that did not finish first or second. Group F, also pretty simple stuff here. Denmark had already qualified so they didn't really have to worry too much. They did lose to Scotland though and speaking of Scotland, they have gone on to the playoff round after they beat Moldova 2-0. Austria was the other top Nations League group winner that did not finish first or second, so they also go off to the playoffs. Now Group G, listen, Turkish fans, it was a joke. But I think there's this pattern with Turkey where whenever you don't expect them to be successful, they are, and vice versa. Because they did well in the qualifiers prior to the Euros, so everyone was hyping them up as these dark horse picks. And then, when something is expected of them, they completely blow it. But props to Dark Horse FC, who acquired six points, and it was enough to get themselves a playoff spot. Now, Norway and the Netherlands was a bit of a different situation for them. Both of them had drawn their first two qualifiers, going into their last qualifier between each other. The Netherlands ended Norway's campaign, beating them 2-0, and they have qualified for the World Cup for the first time since 2014. But unfortunately, no Holland until 2026, I guess. Group H, going into the final match day, was Russia versus Croatia. All Russia had to do to qualify for the World Cup was at least get a draw. A waterlogged pitch would display some of the most chaotic football these qualifiers have seen so far, and unfortunately for Russia, Croatia came on top. So the 2018 finalists go on to qualify for the World Cup for the third straight time, and Russia go into the playoffs. Group I, pretty simple stuff. England did not choke, fortunately for English fans, unfortunately for me. So England go on to qualify for the World Cup while Poland do just enough 
to qualify for the playoffs. Group J, Germany didn't really have to do anything because they had already qualified, but uh, they didn't really let off the gas one bit. Romania would only get a draw against Iceland, which North Macedonia would take full advantage of. Armenia didn't even have to wait for the beatdown from Germany because instead they got a beatdown from North Macedonia, 5-0. And then on the final day to seal a playoff spot, North Macedonia beat Iceland 3-1. Boy, oh f***ing boy. Are these playoffs something else? This is the second part of the recording, uh, as you can see from the, you know, new t-shirt. Before we go into the actual draw itself, here's just a quick explanation of how it works. 12 teams, 2 pots. Pot 1 has all of the seeded teams, and then pot 2 has all the unseeded teams. In the playoffs, there are 3 paths that will determine 3 other members of UEFA that will be going on to World Cup 2022. Each path will have a semi-final and a final, and of course, whoever wins the final goes to Qatar. The draw starts with Scotland being pulled out out of pot 1 first, so they go into path A. Then came Wales on the other side of path A, easily the best case scenario for both nations if they wanted to qualify. Moving forward to path B, Russia gets drawn on one side of path B, and now we await who's on the other side of path B. Sweden. So just when you thought bottling was bad, Italy and Portugal are in the same path. Anyways, on to the unseeded teams. Ukraine and Austria draw into path A. Poland and the Czech Republic draw into path B. Turkey and bless their souls, North Macedonia draw into path C. So the final matchups are as followed. In path A, we have Scotland versus Ukraine and then Wales versus Austria. The winner of Wales versus Austria will host the final. Now on to path B, where we have Russia versus Poland and then Sweden versus the Czech Republic. The winner of Russia versus Poland will host the final of that path. Finally, we have the Death Path. This is where I was reborn. This is where you will pay. Italy versus North Macedonia, Portugal versus Turkey. The winner of Portugal versus Turkey will host the final of the Death Path. The European playoffs were set up to be chaos, and it was that and more. Not they will not have a winner until June, unfortunately. But that did not stop Gareth Bale from having an absolute masterclass versus Austria. His two goals send Wales to the final of Path A, where they'll either face Scotland or Ukraine in Cardiff. Path B, of course, as stated before, had Poland already hosting the final, which left a bout between Sweden and the Czech Republic to determine the other finalist. In a tight battle that would go to extra time, Sweden's Robin Kwajson would score the winner. And then a couple days later was the path B final between Poland and Sweden. Poland took care of business through Robert Lewandowski and Piotr Zielinski to send the Poles to their second consecutive World Cup. Considering Poland did this with a brand new manager is even more impressive. Now let's just hope that their World Cup campaign goes a little smoother than 2018. So, Path C. First was Portugal versus Turkey. Pressure was already up as is, but now Portugal were without Ruben Diaz and Pepe. But luckily for the Portuguese, Turkey again showed how incompetent they are at football as Portugal scored two in the first half. The tides changed, however, in the second. Beautiful passing play gave Turkey a lifeline, and then in the 81st minute, Portugal were continuing to bottle as Turkey had a penalty to tie it all up. <laughs> In the dying minutes of the match, Mateus Nunes scored Portugal's third to send them to the final. Italy versus North Macedonia and Palermo was the other matchup in Path C. This should be an easy road to the final for Italy, but let me tell you about a little phenomenon I call Italian finishing. Italy had 32 shots in this match, and how many goals did they score? Zero. 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 I told you all in the preview that Italy would be missing Chiesa but I did not think it'd be this bad. And Chiro Immobile should be arrested for impersonating a striker. And it's long overdue because once this man puts on the blue shirt, he's Giazzi Zardes. Now I feel like Italy's finishing has kind of taken away from the credit North Macedonia deserves. All night, the entire back line were on the same page making vital stop after vital stop. And they did this giving up just one yellow card. But anyways, with nothing happening in 90 minutes, the game would go to extra time. And it's worth a crack! Damn, damn, damn. How could this happen to me? 
That's right folks, North Macedonia have come back to haunt the Italians again, this time sending them packing back to Rome after Alexander Tchaikovsky's 92nd minute winner. This is the second consecutive time that Italy have failed to qualify for the World Cup. At this point, they should just try playing the rugby squad. But let me put this into bigger perspective. Italy have not been in the World Cup knockout stages since 2006 when they won the trophy. I think we can all now officially call this the sister curse. Now, Leo Benucci was quick to criticize the playoff system, but my guy, all you had to do was beat North Macedonia. And even then, what about the previous round, when Italy couldn't even beat Bulgaria or Northern Ireland? So now it was going to be either Portugal or North Macedonia in the World Cup. And it would be Portugal taking care of business thanks to Bruno Fernandes' two goals. Portugal qualify for the World Cup, and I heard this time they're bringing back the wine red color. As for North Macedonia, they've won the hearts of many around the world not only for the help in mocking Italians everywhere, but for the valiant effort every player made for their country. If anyone ever tells you that international football is dying or that it doesn't matter, just show them North Macedonia's story. African qualifiers decided to change things up a bit. 10 groups, 10 group winners. Those 10 group winners will then advance to a two-legged playoff round to determine five teams going to Qatar. The officially advanced so far is Senegal and Morocco. Algeria and Burkina Faso play against each other in their last qualifying matches. So long as both teams don't drop points prior, this match determines who advances, but more than likely it will be Algeria. Tunisia in Group B will more than likely advance. They have scored eight and conceded none. In Group C, Nigeria did face a shock result against the Central African Republic, but I still don't doubt that they get out of that group. Group D, though, is a little bit more interesting. Assuming both Ivory Coast and Cameroon don't drop points in their first qualifying match of the window, that will set up yet another heavyweight battle. And of course, whoever wins that match wins the group. Group E is much like Group D, but this time it's between Mali and Uganda. Group F has Mo Salah in it. I, I don't think I need to say anything else there. Group G sets up yet another fantastic closer. This time it's between Ghana and South Africa, so that'll be very interesting to see. And then we finally have Group J. It's pretty much every team for themselves. It is likely these teams play only to be battered, but this group is at least to be admired. <laughs> Group A saw Algeria seal a spot after they defeated Djibouti 4-0. In Group B, despite losing to Equatorial Guinea, Tunisia find themselves a spot after defeating Zambia. Group C sees Nigeria advance, but they look like they're struggling a bit. They defeated Liberia, but could only get a draw against Cape Verde. Again, it was still enough to advance, but going into the playoffs, that will ask a bunch of questions. Group D, it came to the final day to determine a winner. Cameroon versus a pretty star-studded Ivory Coast side. Otoko Akambe goal was enough to overtake Ivory Coast and Cameroon go on to the playoffs. You failed me! 500 years I have waited! Now I must wait 500 more! In Group B, Mali finished the deed and they qualify for the playoffs as well. Egypt will be seeing the next round after they finished first in Group F, acquiring 4 points in their last 2 qualifiers. Group G, another group that went right down to the wire, Ghana versus South Africa. Ghana came on top with a 1-0 victory, but let me tell you, there's a little bit of controversy. The goal was a penalty, and uh, let me tell you. I, I don't think that was a penalty. Group H and I were already done. Senegal and Morocco had already advanced to the playoffs last window. And then Group J, pretty interesting stuff. The DR Congo were third going into this window of qualifiers. And miraculously enough, they find themselves first and going into the playoffs now. So, you know, I'm sure my boy Exos is over the moon about that. So, let's go over all the nations that will be going on into the playoff round. Senegal has qualified twice, with their best run being in 2002, where they reached the quarterfinals. Morocco has made it four times to the World Cup with their best performance being a last 16 appearance in 1986. Algeria's best World Cup run came in 2014 where they held their own against the eventual champions for 92 minutes. Nigeria hoped to qualify for a fourth straight tournament, but they also hoped to reach the last 16 for the first time since 1998. Tunisia has qualified five times, but has never escaped the groups. Egypt back in 2017 qualified for their first World Cup since 1990. They'll hope to return again. Ghana in 2010 came within a penalty shootout of being the first African team to reach the semis. However, in 2018, they failed to qualify after seeing their golden generation fizzle out. Cameroon are one of the three African nations to have reached the quarterfinals. That was back in 1990 during the Raja Mila days. The last time DR Congo qualified for a World Cup, it was 1974, when they were a totalitarian dictatorship known as Zaire. Finally, there's Mali, who have never qualified for a single World Cup, but the team is filled with tons of promising talent. 
Let's start with Mali versus Tunisia. As I've said, this was an exciting Mali inside with young talent that could... Never mind. Just to make things worse, the same player who scored the own goal got a red card four minutes later. Mali never recovered from this mistake, and Tunisia would win the tie 1-0, sending them to the World Cup. DR Congo vs Morocco started with a shocker when a cruel deflection gave DR Congo the lead at home. Come on, come on, we're going to the World Cup, we're going to the World Cup! Morocco got a penalty in the second half, but then skied the attempt. But what? <laughs> Luckily, the Moroccan's lightning quick counter a couple minutes later gave them the important away goal. The return in Casablanca was dominated by the Moroccans as they feasted on the remains of DR Congo. And once again, Morocco qualify for the World Cup. Nigeria vs Ghana is one of the biggest rivalries in Africa, and only one nation would be going to Qatar. The first leg in Ghana ended in a tense goalless draw. In the second leg, Thomas Partey gave Ghana an early lead, but most importantly an away goal. Nigeria received a penalty 12 minutes later with William Truste Kong converting it, but the Nigerians could never find that second goal. So yes, the Ghanaians have sh house a World Cup berth. They committed 33 fouls in the second leg, that's almost as much possession they had. As for the Nigerians, they missed the World Cup for the first time in 16 years. And the Nigerian fans were not happy. In fact, they invaded the pitch and started rioting. Cameroon versus Algeria was next, and Islam Samadi gave Algeria the advantage in the first leg. However, the Cameroonians would not make it easy as Eric Choupo-Moting scored early in the second leg. The game went into extra time, where in the 118th minute, Ahmed Touba scored the goal that would send Algeria to the World Cup. But it's never over until it's over. Karo Toko Akambi silences the Algerian crowd in the 124th minute, sending Cameroon to the World Cup after missing out in 2018. This is the same player that sent Cameroon to the playoffs after scoring the only goal against Ivory Coast. As for the Algerians, they again missed the big dance. It's a much bigger shocker this time as they were going into this new year as the best team in Africa. But there will be a lot of questions about the officiating in this match. Cameroon's first goal had a Cameroonian push an Algerian defender into his own keeper. As a result of some of the officiating in this match, Algerians have been spamming everything on social media. I mean everything. Thing. They will not give up until there's a replay of this match, and unfortunately, I don't see that happening because we're talking about FIFA here. Finally, we had the biggest matchup of them all, Senegal versus Egypt. A Senegalese own goal in the fourth minute gave the Egyptians the advantage in the first leg. However, then, an Egyptian own goal in the fourth minute brought the tie level for Senegal. Perfectly balanced. This whole thing should be. The highly contested affair would then go all the way to penalties to decide. Again. And now I think it's a good time to talk about the elephant in the room, the f***ing lasers. There were more laser pointers in that Senegalese stadium than air particles. Every time we saw an Egyptian come up to the penalty spot, it was like they were being surrounded by fireflies. I mean, look at this! Salah's face is green! And the worst part about all of this is the fact that the lasers were going on throughout the entire match, and it's not just one, it's not just two, it's like 50 of them! And not one official decided to, I don't know, stop the game and intervene? And of course, Senegalese fans will defend their actions by saying, well, Egyptians did it first. Now, anyone who uses lasers. Disgrace. I know, hot take. In all fairness, the Egyptians did use a couple lasers, not to the extent of what the Senegalese did. Also, if you were watching the Mali-Tunisia second leg, you saw some lasers too. Again, why was there no action taken? It just makes no sense to me. So yeah, Senegal won the shootout and qualified for the World Cup, and how couldn't they? The Egyptians were over here being blinded by the lasers. I mean, it's a total disgrace, man. The qualifiers for South America are very simple. The format has been a mainstay since 1998. One round, 10 teams. Four go on to qualify automatically, while fifth place goes on to the intercontinental playoffs. So let's quickly introduce every participant. Brazil hoped to qualify and become the first nation to win six World Cups. Uruguay has placed fourth three times and are two-time holders of the trophy with their last title being back in 1950. The last time Argentina have won the World Cup was back in 1986. Since then, they've been finalists twice, most recently, in 2014. Colombia has qualified six times, with their best finish being the quarterfinals in 2014. Chile failed to qualify for 2018, but before managed to reach the last 16 in 2010 and 2014. Their best finish in the tournament, however, was third back in 1962 when they were hosts. Peru back in 2018 qualified for the World Cup for the first time since 1982. They hope to return again with an even better campaign. Paraguay had a pretty successful start to the new millennium with four straight successful qualifications. In 2010, the Paraguayans reached the quarterfinals for the 
first time in their history. However, since then, they failed to qualify for both 2014 and 2018. Ecuador has three appearances at the World Cup, all coming in the 21st century. Their best run was in 2006, when the Ecuadorians made it to the last 16. Bolivia hoped their insane home field advantage finally gives them the upper hand, as the last time they qualified was back in 1994. But at least they're not as down bad as Venezuela, the only active CONMEBOL member to have never qualified for a single World Cup. There's six matches remaining in CONMEBOL, and the table looks extremely tight. Brazil and Argentina are basically pulling away. They are still yet to play each other, though. The Stop. first matchup was actually suspended, the but they do play against each other this window. But as I said before, it's pretty tight below them. There's a five-point gap between fourth and ninth. Uruguay, who are currently fifth right now, hope to bounce back. They had just faced the two powerhouses in the last window. They again have to face one of the powerhouses in Argentina, but after that, they don't face anyone too threatening. Ecuador currently sit third, but third isn't really that much of a safe spot at the moment. They are still yet to play Argentina and Brazil, and actually Ecuador's last qualifier is Argentina. Not really that ideal. Colombia, on the other hand, are fourth, just a point below Ecuador. They too still have to play Argentina and Brazil, but if they can scrap some results here or there, their last match is Venezuela. Best case scenario there. Chile are going to need to max out on points in their next couple of matches because their last four, three of them are Argentina, Brazil, and Uruguay. Now, Peru are ninth right now, and I probably wouldn't mention them if it weren't for the fact that multiple Peruvians have commented on that one Vietnamese video. But 11 points to their name. They're not exactly out of it, but you know, seven losses it doesn't done. really help anyone. Boy, oh boy, does everyone love CONMEBOL, the most peaceful and non-violent confederation there ever was. Brazil qualified for the World Cup in their first qualifier of the window after defeating Colombia. Argentina were able to extend their unbeaten run, and against Brazil, where they got a draw, they qualify for the World Cup too. Ecuador going into this window were just one point above the playoff spot. But now, they find themselves six points above the playoff spot after getting two wins. And this is absolutely huge for them, knowing that they have one of the more difficult schedules going going forward. Colombia could only get one measly point against Paraguay in these qualifiers. They remain fourth but are just one point above elimination. But the biggest mover of the window was Peru. They were ninth going into this window and now they find themselves fifth the playoff spot. They defeated Bolivia and Venezuela, with Gianluca Lapadula finding the net in both matches. He only just started playing for Peru last year, and in 17 caps, he now has five goals. Uruguay continue their terrible form, and no, I'm not just talking about the Argentina loss, I'm also talking about the fact that they lost 3-0 to Bolivia. So yeah, their next couple matches look a lot more simple, they don't exactly have to play Brazil or Argentina anymore, but that Bolivia defeat is definitely going to ask some questions. But after this November window, the South American qualifiers are looking as tight as ever. Between 4th and 9th is a 4 point gap. This could go straight to the wire and be one of the most exciting final days in World Cup Qatar qualification. We'll start out with the South American regions. And oh Colombia, 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 Colombia. I don't want to see anymore. I don't want to see anymore, bro. Winless and scoreless in their last five qualifiers. They needed things to change up this window. First was Peru, where the urgency to score goals meant them going all out attack, basically. Colombia dominated with 30 shots, but didn't score once with just two on goal. Peru, on the other hand, only needed one shot on target to win the match. After the game, I presume that the home fans weren't really that happy after throwing projectiles at their own players. Next was Argentina, and you guessed it, Colombia didn't score again. Argentina went on to extend their own streak of 29 games unbeaten, and it should be mentioned that Lautaro Martinez has 7 goals in this campaign. But throughout every single preview and review, we have seen this Colombian side die a slow and very painful death. Shoot me. I can't take it anymore. In this window alone, they went from 4th, a qualification spot, all the way down to 7th. Lord knows what is happening with this Colombian side, but their players cannot finish for shit. One nation who has had a completely opposite story though, 
Peru. Since their abysmal starts, they have only lost one of their last five matches. Colombia was already mentioned, but Peru also grabbed a massive point against Ecuador. And with two games to go, Peru is hanging on to that fifth place intercontinental spot with their lives. Ecuador had some pretty difficult fixtures, but they still managed to get some results at least. Peru away was a squander three points, despite Ecuador having Josh f***ing Allen on the pitch. Brazil was the other fixture, and this was the epitome of Conmebol chaos. First, it started with Brazil scoring in the first six minutes. Then, you had Ecuador's keeper Alexander Dominguez pulling a Nigel de Jong. But unlike Nigel, Alexander got a red card for his antics. And then just five minutes later, Emerson Royale gets his second yellow. It's only been 20 minutes, mind you. Then another five minutes pass and Allison is sent off. However, VAR goes back and decides it's just a yellow. Later into the second half, Ecuador grab a huge equalizer. But wait. There's somehow more. Allison gets sent off again, but then that's rescinded again after VAR finds out Allison didn't game end the Ecuadorian on purpose. Finally, the game ends, and it's an ideal point for Ecuador while Brazil are still yet to lose in their campaign after eliminating Paraguay. And breathe. Ecuador only got two points in this window, but one win next window, and they're into the big dance. Uruguay started this window in seventh after some terrible performances, and that resulted in their longtime head coach being sacked. And with their new coach, Diego Alonso, they got two massive victories against Paraguay and Venezuela. They've now jumped up to fourth, just one point above Peru. Chile still have a chance to qualify, and that's all thanks to Prime Alexis Sanchez just popping out of nowhere. He scored two goals in a five-goal thriller against Bolivia. Speaking of Bolivia, Olivia, this is a window to forget. Along with the loss versus Chile, Salomon Rondon made the sea level merchants his bitch. They can no longer automatically qualify, but the intercontinental spot is still in the distance. Going into the last two matches, there were still three spots up for grabs in South America. Ecuador could not beat Paraguay thanks to a lot of silly errors, but luckily for them, Chile were thrashed 4-0 and Uruguay beat Peru 1-0, thus locking automatic qualification for the Ecuadorians. Speaking of the Uruguay-Peru match, there's a lot of questions regarding whether this ball crossed the line. In fact, we've seen people use rulers on TVs and even software to determine whether or not the goal should have been awarded to Peru. For me, even with the best angle, it's really hard to tell. What is a little bit suspicious to me, and I was watching the match too, is how quick the VAR call was. I don't think there was goal line technology, and the official never took a closer look. And I just find that a little bit odd. But had that been a goal, Peru could have still had a chance to win the last automatic spot. Uruguay's 1-0 result was enough to grab that last spot. The Peruvians would now have to hang on to their playoff spots on the final day. Those still alive and hungry were Chile and Colombia. Colombia in their previous match, believe it or not, actually scored a goal. They actually scored three. Their win also eliminated the less than 1% chance Bolivia had of finishing fifth. Chile losing was bad enough, but a 4-0 loss meant their hopes were all but gone because of goal differential. They lost to Uruguay 2-0 on the final day, which fully eliminated them. So it really just came down to Peru and Colombia for the last spot. Colombia did their job and defeated Venezuela, but that win would mean jack sh as Peru defeated Paraguay 2-0, meaning Peru are off to the intercontinental playoffs to play whichever team wins the Asian playoff round in June. The first round of qualifiers saw the 12 worst ranked Asian nations go at it in a two-legged playoff round. At the end, six nations would advance to the second round. Mongolia just edged past Brunei after fumbling a 2-0 lead. Macau won 1-0 against Sri Lanka in the first leg. However, due to the Easter attacks in Sri Lanka, Macau a day before the second leg refused to travel, resulting in the worst ranked of the bunch Sri Lankans being rewarded a 3-0 result and a ticket to the second round. Bangladesh did just enough to qualify for the next round. Malaysia looked completely out of place and shredded Timor Leste 12 2 on aggregate. The Angkor Warriors, Cambodia, took down the Pakistanis, winning 4 1 on aggregate. And finally, after losing 1 0 to Bhutan in the first leg, Guam returned home and terminated the Dragon Boys. Better luck next time, guys. At least you still got drip. You can the second round of Asian qualifiers consists of eight groups with at least one nation advancing to the third round in each. Group A saw Syria advance as winners, while China were the best ranked runners up team thanks to Wu Lei's eight goals, so they also advanced as well. Australia cleaned up Group B, winning every one of their eight fixtures. Iran not only qualified for the next round from Group C, they also made an example of Cambodia. 
twice. Iraq were one of the best runners up teams, so they advanced as well. Saudi Arabia also went unbeaten in their group to make it to the third round. As Qatar were automatically in the tournament, they only participated in the second round to qualify successfully for the 2023 Asian Cup. However, Oman managed to pull through and earned a spot. Much like Australia, Japan sweeped their competition in Group F. And at one stage of this round, the Blue Samurai dismantled Mongolia 14-0 in March. Then two months later, they erased Myanmar with Yuya Osako scoring half of the goals. Group G, or as I like to call it, the AFF Championship plus the UAE. This group saw the Emiratis take the top spot on the final day after being the Vietnamese. Ali Mabgut of the UAE scored 11 goals in just this round alone. Speaking of my great Viet brothers though, they also advanced to the third round. And finally in Group H, South Korea also went unbeaten, and Lebanon also joins them in the next round. Also, North Korea were in this group, and they weren't doing too bad until they decided to withdraw. On to the third round, where there's two groups, and in each group there will be two that automatically qualify, while the third place finishers of each group go on to the fourth round, which is the playoff round. And from there, whoever wins the playoff round goes on to the intercontinental playoffs. Group A consists of group winners Iran, South Korea, Syria, and the UAE, with runners-up Iraq and Lebanon. Iran has qualified four times and hope to qualify and finally make it out of the groups. South Korea will always be remembered for their improbable, and controversial, runs to the semi-finals of World Cup 2002. Syria has never qualified once for the World Cup, but came very close after reaching the playoff round in 2017. The UAE have only qualified once. It was World Cup 1990 where they got grouped. Iraq have only made one appearance and it was back in 1986. Lebanon come into this round as the worst ranked and have never qualified. Group B consists of group winners Australia, Japan, and Saudi Arabia, with runners-up China, Oman, and Vietnam. Australia, since that infamous penalty shootout against Uruguay, has qualified for every World Cup. Their best run saw them reach the round of 16 in 2006. Since the agony of Doha, Japan has qualified every time since 1998. The farthest the Japanese have ever gone in the World Cup is the round of 16 three times. They'll hope to finally reach the quarters, that way another anime doesn't point out how hopeless their strikers are. After a mild disappearance in the early 2010s, Saudi Arabia qualified for World Cup 2018, but their best run goes back to 1994, where they reached the last 16. China has only ever qualified once for the tournament, and they failed to grab a single point. But hey, at least Xi Jinping has a solution. <laughs> never mind. Oman has never qualified for the World Cup, but as of late has been improving. The same can be said about the Vietnamese, who reached the final round for the first time ever. With six matches remaining, both Iran and South Korea will more than likely automatically qualify for the World Cup. Lebanon are the surprise here, as they're currently third place. And might I add, they are the lowest ranked team in this qualification round. UAE, I thought, were the favorites to be third place, but right now, they're a bit disappointing. It should be mentioned, though, the top overall scorer of the World Cup qualifiers is striker Ali Mabgut of UAE. I don't think this gets talked about enough, but this man has 78 goals in 96 caps. Now over in Group B, Saudi Arabia are completely undefeated. They've won every single match so far, and Australia are just right behind them. But what really is the biggest surprise in the Asian qualifier so far is the fact that Oman are currently in third. Early on, Japan has struggled quite a bit. They actually lost against Oman in their very first qualifier. But Japan have bounced back with a win against Australia, and this wasn't just any win, this was a win that broke Australia's record-breaking run. The Japanese against Australia looked like their old so could this be the bounce back? Now you might be asking yourselves, Huh, Maxwell, why are Vietnam so bad? Listen, Vietnam recently allowed fans back in stadiums. We are going to beat Japan. We are going to beat Saudi Arabia. The dream is not dead yet. I will say though, the next time we face up against the citizenship merchants, we're beating them. No question. I can't stop the Asian qualifiers, an exciting time for everyone besides the Vietnamese. Let's look at Group A first. Having beaten Lebanon with a late winner and then Syria, Iran could actually qualify for the World Cup in the next window. They've scored the most goals of any Asian nation so far, with Ali Reza Jahanbash having scored three of them. Also, prior to the November window, Mehdi Taremi, who is a... Uh a little opinionated on Twitter sometimes, this is not the first time this has happened. He was left out of this squad after criticizing the coach on Twitter. In second place, South Korea could also find themselves in the World Cup in the next window as they're 8 points above third place UAE. Now the UAE lost to South Korea in this window, but they finally got themselves a victory jumping them up to third place after they defeated Lebanon. Now as for Iraq and Syria, 
they're just kind of vibing. Group B still sees Saudi Arabia continuing to hold on to that top spot. Japan also got some massive results as they continue to improve in form after a terrible start. They beat Vietnam 1-0 and got some revenge in Oma. Junior Ito is in some fine form as he scored in both matches. Now after losing to Japan in October, Australia haven't really recovered. They could only get themselves two draws. To be fair, one of them was against Saudi Arabia, but the other one was against China. That's definitely not something you want to see as an Aussie. What the Aussies also don't want to see is themselves in the playoff spot once again, just four points above Oman. Now Oman, as opposed to the last window where the refs were paid, they could earn only just one point against China. Speaking of China, it's unlikely that they find themselves in a playoff spot, let alone qualify for the World Cup, but Wu Lei right now with four goals is the current top scorer in Asian qualifiers. A and yes, I, I know. Vietnam still have zero points. We firstly start off with Mehdi Taremi's goal in the 48th minute versus Iraq, which was enough to send Iran to their third consecutive World Cup. And no son, no problem. Two wins from South Korea, including a 2-0 score versus Syria featuring the Kim Wall, sees South Korea also going to Qatar. So it all comes down to the playoff spots. UAE were able to gain a win and extend their gap between them and Lebanon to three points. Lebanon and Iraq could only get a point from each other, but are still able to grab third spot on the final day. Bad luck to talk. Group B, on the other hand, is very eventful at the top. No one has qualified just yet. Saudi Arabia came close to defeating Oman, but their qualification party will have to wait after Japan's impressive 2-0 win in Saitama. Speaking of Japan, after having a pretty abysmal start, they are on fire, having seemingly worked out all the kinks. They've won their last five matches, but not only that, they have kept clean sheets in four. Junya Watanabe? No. But Junya Ito has scored in his last four consecutive matches. And the midfield trio of Eo Tanaka, Hidemasa Morita, and Wataru Endo have played a huge part in the recent success. Australia took care of business against Vietnam, but could only grab a point in Oman thanks to some careless mistakes in the back. But luckily for Australia, Oman's point was not enough to keep their hopes alive. However, the Aussies will still be hunting for an automatic qualification spot because remember AFC face up against Conmo Bulls team in the Intercontinental Playoffs. China have not won since October when they defeated Vietnam at the death and following a loss to Japan the Chinese were demolished by Vietnam on Lunar New Year the nation's fifth consecutive loss. And what followed was a complete meltdown on Chinese social media. Some were even calling for the disbandment of the team altogether. As for Vietnam, after seven straight losses, this team finally gets their first win in the final round of qualifiers. It is also the first time a Southeast Asian team has won in the final round of qualifiers. <laughs> Group A and Asian qualifiers had just the playoff spot remaining. The UAE were holding onto this spot with Iraq and Lebanon breathing down their necks. Lebanon bottled it against Syria and were eliminated after losing to Iran on the final day. But Iraq got the upper hand defeating the UAE, putting them just one point below the playoff spot. With the UAE playing South Korea, it gave Iraq the best chance to steal the playoff spot on the final day as they were playing Syria. However, they also bottled and were eliminated after a draw. UAE, on the other hand, defeated the Kim Wall to hold onto the playoff spot thanks to a strike from teenager Ale Abdullah. What's even more incredible is this is the first time they've defeated South Korea since 2006. Say it. I concede. Group B, on the other hand, was a fight for the two automatic spots between Saudi Arabia, Japan, and Australia. The Saudis could only conjure a draw against the citizenship merchants, however, Japan had their backs defeating Australia 2-0, sending the Saudis to Qatar. Uyosa Juluaz's Karu Mitoma sent the Japanese to Qatar with two strikes very late on. Japan were again quite generous to the Saudis when Vietnam held the Japanese to a draw, meaning Saudi Arabia would win the group after defeating the Aussies. Australia, on the other hand, will have to play UAE in a one legged playoff to determine who gets to play Peru. Over to Oceania, where things were not off to a great start for both Vanuatu and the Cook Islands. Both squads had a COVID outbreak and would have to withdraw from the competition, meaning Solomon Islands and Tahiti would advance automatically. The Solomon god himself, Rafael Leai, scored a hat-trick to lead the Bonitos to a group win. In the other group, New Zealand would win pretty comfortably, with Papua New Guinea advancing as runner-ups. In the semis, the Solomon Islands defeated Papua New Guinea in a five-goal thriller, while Empoli's Liberato Kaseki helped New Zealand pass Tahiti. So now was the final everyone had predicted. 
Chieftain, Solomon Islands versus New Zealand. Could the Solomon Dream live on and dethrone the Kings of Oceania? Unfortunately, not this year. New Zealand will now play the CONCACAF team in the Intercontinental Playoffs. CONCACAF initially had NASCAR levels of buffoonery coming up with their brand new qualification format. The idea was for the top 6 ranked CONCACAF teams to play the typical round robin they usually do, but the rest of the lower teams would go into this World Cup tournament, and the winner of said tournament would then play the team that finished 4th in the hexagonal, and the winner of that match would then move on to the Intercontinental Playoffs. Thank f that all changed. The new format was a lot more simple. We can thank COVID for that. The top five CONCACAF nations would still have somewhat of an advantage by not having to participate until the final round. That includes Mexico, the US, Jamaica, Honduras, and Costa Rica. The first round of CONCACAF qualifiers would see the rest of the teams go into groups, with only the winner advancing to the second round. El Salvador advanced out of Group A after going unbeaten and conceding just a single goal against Montserrat's Lyle Taylor. After smacking up Aruba 7-0 and the Cayman Islands 11-0, Canada marched to the second round. Curaçao became the third nation to advance to the next round after winning three and drawing one. Panama decided to make Anguilla's life a living hell, scoring 19 goals in two matches against them, and after another two victories, they advanced as well. Haiti are one of the only four nations from the Caribbean to have qualified for a World Cup, and after three wins, they moved on. Finally, the Sugar Boys, with a Z, St. Kitts and Nevis, qualified for the next round after edging past Trinidad. The second round would see nine teams break into three two-legged ties. Winners of each tie would join the other five in the final round of CONCACAF qualifiers. Nothing was sweet for the Sugar Boys in this round, as the Salvadorians chopped them up 6-0 on aggregate. Canada earned a spot in the final round for the first time since 1997 after defeating Haiti 4-0 on aggregate. And finally, Panama would join the two after doing just enough in the first leg against Curaçao. So we're into the final round, where the top three advance automatically and the fourth place team goes on to the Inter continental playoffs. And here's a quick overview of the teams. Mexico's best runs in the World Cup came in 1970 and 1986 as hosts in both where they reached the quarterfinals. However, since then, despite always uncovering some kind of magic, the Mexicans have failed to escape the clutches of Quinto Partido. The US failed to qualify for 2018 after an embarrassing loss to Trinidad on the final day. I made a video about this, so if you just want to see someone's emotions unravel, you can, you can go click it. Their best finish was in 1930, but because there was probably like three fans of the sport in the US at the time, 2002's quarterfinal run is celebrated more. Costa Rica has made four appearances, with 2014 being the most memorable, where they defied all the odds of a group of death and took the Netherlands to penalties in the quarterfinals. Honduras has managed to make the big dance three times, but has never won in any of them. I mean, hell, my only memory of Honduras is when David Villa did this to them. The Salvadorians have two appearances under their belts and have scored just one single goal goal. That goal was in a 10-1 loss to Hungary. But hey, at least they scored a goal, unlike Canada, whose only appearance goes all the way back to 1986. And finally, there's Panama. Their first World Cup was back in 2018, where they finished last. Mexico are currently three points above second place United States, with third place being Canada. The top three have two matchups in this window, with the US versus Mexico on November 12th, and Canada versus Mexico on November 16th. For Mexico, this could either backfire or could be the instance where they cement themselves in the World Cup for next year. US supporters are still in the state of, I don't know what the hell to think about this team. Or at least that's just me. And like every squad announcement, Greg Berhalter has yet again caused a firestorm in USMNT Twitter. After Mexico, the US will also play Jamaica, so here's me hoping they don't overlook Jamaica. Now Canada are placed third, as I've said before, and their fans are experiencing probably the best football that the Canadians have ever seen. And it kind of helps out when you have the best player in CONCACAF right now, Alfonso Davies, and an informed striker in Jonathan David, who is carrying Leo right now. Aside from Mexico, the Canadians will also face the senior citizens of Costa Rica. Panama are currently in that fourth place position, which would be the Intercontinental Playoffs. Their next two matches, though, are Honduras, who look absolutely terrible, and El Salvador. So if they play their cards right, there's a possibility they could jump into third. Antonio is in the Jamaican squad this window, I'm pretty sure, and so is Leon Bailey. So maybe we'll see Jamaica pull off a win or two. Also, special mention to El Salvador. I wouldn't particularly count them out because they have some pretty decent young talent, and they also have the best atmosphere in CONCACAF at the moment.
I don't think many people saw this happening, but Canada are currently top of CONCACAF qualifying. And to be honest, I'm not really that shocked as most people are. They've been solid throughout and they have not lost a single match so far. Also, I should mention K Kyle, Sile. It's either one. But this man deserves some love. But really isn't a shock that this man is top scorer in the qualifiers. He's literally played for a club called Sigma FC. On their way to the top in this window, Canada defeated the senior citizens of Costa Rica and Mexico. And speaking of Mexico, they aren't really looking that good. First was Dosa Cero, and then Dosa Uno. As I said in the last qualifier video, Mexico could either see some good points going into a couple easier matches, or this could be a straight disaster for them. They have dropped from first straight down to third, where they're now tied with Panama. Now to second place, the United States, where I really think we made a statement with that Dosa Cero with a very inexperienced and young team. But I think that team was still stuck in Cincinnati when we were playing Jamaica because we really didn't look that great. Jamaica 100% deserved the win. And I don't know why we have to wait till next year for VAR in CONCACAF qualifying. It is ridiculous. And as a US fan, yeah, I, I will take a draw, especially after that terrible performance. I mean, still, it, it is very weird that we just don't have VAR. The one uber positive when it comes to the United States, however, is Tim Weah. He's a goddamn baller. I never not want to see him in the squad. Now speaking of Jamaica, the addition of Mikel Antonio has paid many many dividends. Do not be shocked if the reggae boys can find some form in these next few qualifiers and find themselves, I don't know, maybe top 4. It's possible. I really do believe this team, especially how they played against us, could do that. Panama also had a really good window. Not only, as I mentioned before, are they tied with Mexico, they've scored as many goals as Mexico. But in the November window, Panama rallied back from 2-0 down in the last 15 minutes to win 3-2 in Honduras. Then they came back from 1-0 down to defeat El Salvador 2-1. And speaking of El Salvador, this is definitely one of those windows they'll want to forget. But hey, at least you guys aren't Honduras who still haven't won once. Canada came in through this window missing a couple players including their star Alfonso Davies. But you know who they weren't missing? Jonathan David. The Canadians won every single game this window 2-0, including against the United States and Hamilton. The Canadians win against El Salvador means they're assured at least intercontinental playoffs. It is truly an incredible time to be a fan of Canadian football. The United States, despite having a pretty bumpy road this time around, still maintain second place. The first match against El Salvador proved that whenever Greg Berhalter faces a proper system, he's going to be outplayed. The US barely scratched a win where on another day El Salvador grabs a point. Next was Canada, where all those flaws seen against El Salvador were exposed in its fullest. After losing to the Canadians 2-0, Greg Berhalter in a press conference claimed to have dominated Canada. Man, not this shit again. Finally was Honduras, the most convincing result against one of the worst Honduran sides in recent time. Wait, he's taking selfies? In the middle of the match? Have some fucking respect! In hell, I hate this mother Mexico were not doing too hot going into January, with Panama breathing down their necks. They were going to need a lot of improvement in order to keep their qualification hopes alive. And it didn't start off great conceding against Jamaica, but in just three minutes, the Mexicans turned it around for three points. Mexico then followed that up with an uninspiring performance against Costa Rica, but the Mexican Greg Berhalter ended the window on a high, beating Panama in controversial fashion. A solid showing on paper, but this Mexican side is still very underwhelming. Much like the US, if this team qualifies for the World Cup, expect them to be out in the group stages if Tata stays. Panama couldn't get much out of this window besides a win against Jamaica. They are barely holding on to 4th place, with their next couple of matches being against the US and Canada. As for the reggae boys, they are officially eliminated with fans scratching their heads thinking how could so much potential be thrown away. I'm talking to God himself! I need prayer! I need my prayers! Answer for just once! Speaking of elimination, that would be the case for Honduras. Too. Costa Rica, on the other hand, were not mentioned in the preview, but definitely should be in the review because they had a massive window. Shrines in the US and Mexico will be created in Brian Ruiz's name thanks to his game-winning goal versus Panama. And following a nil-nil draw against Mexico, Los Ticos grabbed the win against Jamaica. They sit fifth, just below Panama, having revived their campaign, scoring the second most points in this window alone. El Salvador, this window, entered the portal to hell having to face both first and second place. But a win versus Honduras keeps their qualification hopes barely alive.
Every spot was still up for grabs with three matches remaining for each nation. On the third to last match day, El Salvador were eliminated after drawing to England B. Costa Rica's form was improving at the perfect time and they grabbed a huge win against the Canadians. And all while that was happening, USA and Mexico were seeing who could f*** up their chances the worst. On the second to last match day, Canada's 4-0 win against Jamaica would finally earn them a spot in the World Cup for the first time since 1986. <laughs> Mexico edged past Honduras 1-0 just about sealing their spot in the World Cup since their last opponents were El Salvador. The US slapped around Panama 5-1 in Orlando. Costa Rica defeated El Salvador which eliminated the Panamanians. Then on the final day, Mexico qualified for the World Cup after beating El Salvador, the US doing the bare minimum as per usual, just barely qualified automatically after losing 2-0 to Costa Rica, which leaves Costa Rica in the playoff spot facing New Zealand in June. Asian qualifiers weren't necessarily done yet either with the playoff round between Australia and the UAE. We'd have to wait all the way until the 53rd minute for Australia to open the score through Jackson Irvine. However, the Emiratis replied just four minutes later through Caio Canedo. On a completely different note, Caio was one of the seven Brazilians who falsified documents to play for East Timor. You're a fraud! East Timor national team. <laughs> Then 84 minutes played a cruel deflection off Aiden Hustik's cleanly struck volley gave Australia the winner. So then came Judgment Day almost a week later, a one-match intercontinental playoff between Peru and Australia. Through the first half, both teams played very cautious. Peru may be a little too cautious. Australia were surprisingly looking like the better team. They were creating better quality chances, and the defense turned Andre Carrillo into Peru's version of Nicola Pepe. The second half didn't see much change, despite the Fox commentators saying there'd be some massive Peruvian game-changing team talk at halftime. Although again, it'd be the Aussies with the best chances. So then came extra time, where Peru took a bit more urgency and had the best chance of the game, unfortunately denied by the post. So after 120 minutes played, the game would go down to a penalty shootout, and a very nervy one at that. Australia's Martin Boyle was the first to take his penalty and had his shot saved by Pedro Galese. Now right before the penalty shootout, Aussie head coach Graham Arnold had taken off keeper Matt Ryan for Andrew Redmayne. And you might ask yourself, who the f*** is Andrew Redmayne? Andrew Redmayne is a goalkeeper for Sydney FC, known for his antics, if you will. Back in 2019, during a penalty shootout, his dancing put the opposing penalty takers into a daze and Sydney FC became champions of Australia. So here he was now, with the nation's hopes on his shoulders. And he began to dance. Lapadula scores! Maybe next time. Aaron Moy was up next and he scored Australia's first. Has scored. I'm starting to think that this might not be working. Luckily, Craig Goodwin did his job, and then Peru's Luis Advincula, seemingly hypnotized by the dance master, hit the post. So with the score all level, Frankfurt's Aiden Hustig scored for Australia, followed by Renato Tapia leveling the score for Peru. Both teams scored on their fifth attempts, which meant sudden death. Substitute Awer Mobile stepped up and buried his penalty. Then up came Alex Valera to keep Peru alive, but the Fortnite emote man said no. Andrew Redmayne sends the Australians to the World Cup. He's a, piece of sh a shock result for many who believe Peru were the favorites, but as we've seen time and time again, odds only mean so much when World Cup qualification is on the line. Andrew Redmayne will forever go down as a legend just like Aloisi back in 2005. May we hopefully see him do the take the L dance after saving an Mbappe penalty. Costa Rica versus New Zealand was our other intercontinental playoff, and this would determine the very last remaining spot in Qatar. In just two minutes, Costa Rica opened opened the score with their first attack through Joel Campbell assisted by one of Costa Rica's promising talents. From there, the game plan was to sit back and soak up pressure. However, New Zealand equalized in the 38th minute, only for VAR to call it back. I don't know man, for me, it doesn't really look like a penalty. He has his hand on his knee, but in no way can that generate enough momentum to take someone down like that. In the second half, the All Whites went down to 10 men, and not even a minute later a Costa Rican player elbowed a New Zealand defender and nothing 
was called. In fact, Winston Reed was the one who was booked after the play. New Zealand were surprisingly playing some of the best football I've seen from them in a long time, but unfortunately, the man between the sticks was Kaylor Navas. The Costa Rican shot stopper made four huge saves, and because of the hero himself, Costa Rica go to the World Cup for a third straight time. And just like that, the World Cup is now set, so let's go look at the group, shall we? Group A, we have host Qatar, the Netherlands, Senegal, and Ecuador. Speaking of Ecuador, this man probably can't enter at least two or three countries now in South America. Group B features England, the US, Iran, and now the qualified Wales. Group C features Argentina, Mexico, Poland, and Saudi Arabia. Group D, France, Denmark, Tunisia, and the now qualified Australia. Group E features Spain, Germany, Japan, and Kaylor Navas is Costa Rica. Group F, Belgium, Croatia, Morocco, and Canada. Group G gives us 2018 yet again with Brazil, Serbia, and Switzerland, and the addition of Cameroon. Finally, we have Group H, Portugal and Uruguay, who faced in the round of 16, and then South Korea and Ghana. So. That is how every single team qualified for the World Cup, in pretty decent detail. You know, I loved making those World Cup review videos, so I just wanted them to get even more attention than they already have. But speaking of the reviews, I'm real excited to make the previews for the World Cup, but more importantly, the reviews of the group stage and the knockouts. I'm gonna have a ton of fun with that. But of course, a massive shout out to all our patrons, including Janusz Balash, Sentley Hank Dennis, El Favi, Miliwe 9 Alex Rod, Ulta, Amin Suomez, Aresan, Arnulfo Martinez Jr., Daniel Ortiz, Francisco Hernandez, Juan Leras, KBFM, Luke Fitzsimmons, Miguel Munoz, Nguyen Din Mintang, Parafocus, Return Fire, Rory Burns, Subscribe to Tendetem, The Motor Drive, Tomicus, Vanilla Mexican 17, Victor, Carlos G, Chris Damasena, David Dunn, Declan Malloy, Dominic Griffin, Emmett Shea, Lewis, Jordan Clavett, Mohamed Albok Hale, MX Wee, Patrick Barley, President Pulisic, and Unbroken Persona. If you'd like to join the Patreon, there'll be a link down below and up in the annotations. You can follow my Twitter if you want. It's pretty close to 10k. It'd be pretty cool to hit that number. Follow my Instagram if you want as well. Follow my TikTok, trying to get to 15,000 there. And of course, you can follow my semi-active Twitch. But until then, I'll see you guys.